Okay, so now getting into the cash flow waterfall, we're looking at cash flow available for debt service. So we take revenue, less expenses, and less working capital, which has not been shown here. So working capital is the adjustment from an accrual basis to a cash basis. And obviously we're looking at a cash flow waterfall here. So it's very, very important we look on a cash basis. We shouldn't be looking at anything on an income statement or P&L basis, which is the accrual method, everything on a cash basis. So we're adjusting for cash. Less the capex, less tax. And so I encourage you to fill in those numbers so far based on the calculations and the numbers that you've been given to date and so that you can have a go at calculating CFADs. Okay, so filling that out, reasonably simple. So revenue's flat, expenses are flat, and gives us a flat operating cash flow, and CapEx is flat, but tax has been calculated and it changes over time. So we end up with a slightly variable CFADs there of about 800 million pounds. Okay, so now we're getting into the metric side of things. So debt service coverage ratio, we covered that previously, but it's the CFADs divided by the debt service. So the interest plus principal. So how many times can CFADs here cover the total debt service? And it's a simple division. And there we go. So 1.15 times for the first year and then increasing over time. Why might it be increasing over time? Well, that's a feature of the style of debt repayment that we've selected. So because we've selected fixed principal, the total of principal plus interest decreases over time. So it starts off very high, which results in a low DSCR, and it decreases over time. So more on that later. So 1.15 times is pretty low, and what it means is that there's not much of a buffer for if things go wrong. So in a wind farm, for example, this might be 1.2 or 1.3, and for a gold mine or for a merchant power plant, it might be 1.5 or 2, depending on different aspects. So this is quite low here. It's worth noting here that lenders will define at what stage lockup occurs or default occurs. Lockup being that no distributions can occur if the DSCR goes below a certain level. So potentially if it goes below 1.1 or something like that, then the project enters lockup and no distributions may occur. And if it goes below 1.05 or something like that, you might get default. So the project defaults overall and the lender gets step and right. So they can run the project as they see fit. Needless to say, something that you absolutely want to avoid. Okay, let's turn our attention to the loan life coverage ratio. And so this is a bit more nuanced concept, but the basics are there. So coverage of the CFADs of the loan life divided by the debt balance. So how many times does the discounted CFADs, discounted to today, that's why it's NPV, cover the current debt balance. And it's a beginning of period ratio. So how do we calculate? Well, we calculate the net present value of CFADs and we take the NPV of CFADs divided by the opening balance because it's a beginning of period ratio. Okay, so what this is saying is at the beginning of the debt pay down period from year four, we have an LLCR of 1.47 times. So the present value of CFADs only over the loan life can cover the debt balance 1.47 times when that CFADs has been discounted at the cost of debt. So it's discounted using the interest rate. Okay, also worth mentioning here the project life coverage ratio, slightly different ratio. The CFADs is not just taken over the loan life, i.e. the tenor of debt. It's also taken over the debt tail so that you get the total project cash flows over the project life. That number should be bigger. And then you divide it by the debt balance. So the PLCR, project life coverage ratio, should be bigger than the LLCR. Okay, moving on to returns metrics. So let's evaluate the equity IRR. So the investment amount is as we've previously calculated. It's what equity is putting in. And then the distribution comes from the cash flow after paying the debt service. Okay, so after paying down the debt service, we are distributing all the cash flow available to equity. And so the IRR is calculating using this net equity cash flow, so the distributions less the investment, and we're calculating it using a inbuilt IRR function in Excel, the XIRR function. Now bear in mind that this isn't just seven years worth of cash flows, this is 25 years of cash flows that we're calculating this over, and there's no terminal value at the end. Okay, so in terms of equity IRR concepts, what we're essentially doing here is we are setting the discount rate so that the investments balance the distributions. The investments being the three green bars at the start there, 
and then the distributions being the other green bars. Now, as we increase the discount rate, those cash flows that are further away will tend to decrease. And so that affects the balance of the distributions. And the cash flows that occur closer to us now get less affected by an increase in discount rate. Putting the distributions in context, adding back the debt service gives us the CFADs. And then adding all the cash flows back, so the capex and the tax and the operation cost, will build us back up to the revenue to all stakeholders. Okay, so let's move on to the project RR. So the project RR basically assumes that there is no debt used for the project. It's irrespective of capital structure. So the investment amount will equal the construction capex plus the development costs. And there's no interest during construction or financing fees because we're assuming that there's no debt for the project. And the outflows, so the net project cash flow, is basically the cash generated by the project. And once again, the IRR is the percentage which sets the net present value to zero. So the discounted cash flows equals the discounted investment of these cash flows. 